just uh, casually cutting lightning bolts out of uh, scrap metal. Um, I don't do any plasma cutting in the workshop. Um, everyone's just gone home. Just want to shoot the videos. But the reason to show plasma cutting is that that arc of plasma, that electricity cutting through this metal, is what, in a worst case scenario, can happen with an electric vehicle battery system. And you know everything that that we and every other manufacturer is doing is to prevent that from normal driving to impact to rollover to an error in charging. All these systems, maybe 90% of the parts we put in the electric system are designed for safety, are there to protect these outlier situations to prevent anything like this from ever happening. However, we have experienced something like this firsthand and not in a running vehicle, but when in our early prototypes, we were building a, um, a small battery pack, just a tester motor. We we're using the Kelb cells, so the small blue cells. They were connected up. It was in a small battery box in the car. We'd run the motor, we'd done the test. We were removing it. Um, and it slipped, it, it dropped maybe 50 mil. And in that, a bit of metal contacted with the terminal of one of the batteries, and that created a plasma arc that burst plasma through the exterior of the battery box. Luckily, everyone's wearing safety gear, and it was all fine. But it made us really realize how that we designed this system with all these levels of safety and redundancy when it was complete and in the vehicle but not all these levels of safety and redundancy during the assembly process. And I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, plugging all this stuff together, there's a lot of wires, a lot of cables, all this stuff. It's very easy to, and it's not a shortcut, but it's easy to do something where, well, the one last step involves something quite dangerous. And we realized that as we were growing and wanting to build these vehicles at scale, we needed a process that cut any risk during that that process and that's one of the reasons we moved to the Tesla modules but it was also helped develop the you know the processes and the and the, a redesign basically of the battery systems which involves some extra parts but meant that there's never a chance that you can ever have a short circuit in a battery system at any stage of its production. These crates I'm sitting on are all full of Tesla battery modules and they're the batteries that we put in all of the vehicles we're building at the moment whether that's a 1961 series 2a or a Puma Defender from 2013. They have some of the best energy density available. They have some of the best cooling systems available. They're very easy to work with. And luckily for us, they fit perfectly within the chassis of a series Land Rover. This is a driver's and a passenger side battery box that have just finished electrical assembly. From here, they'll go on and have their coolant systems fitted around the back here. Those are the temporary pipes in between the in and the out of each Tesla module. And then they'll go through to final sealing. So that's weather and waterproofing sealing. And then they'll have a polyurethane coating over the whole box uh, to completely seal it. Things you can see to see on the back, uh, this vent, which is a, um, uh, an air pressure vent, lets air in and out, but doesn't let moisture in and out. We've got the positive and negative connector for the battery, so the, you know, where the, all the, the real electricity flows. Uh, a connector on here for a 14 pin switch, which is where all the control signals go for the BMS modules up here. So we use all Ziva gear, which is uh, by an Australian company. Um, really, really nice system. We can distribute the BMS modules around each battery pack. So we have CAN bus coming in, to, to each module, looping through and then looping back out. And that creates a circuit all around the car of CAN bus, which is like a control wiring. So we have two temperature sensors in each Tesla battery, just like Tesla did, um, basically on the inlet and the outlet, um, sort of two edges of the, the, the coolant circuit. So we can always monitor that, that temperature. I'm gonna try and cut to some other footage from earlier during this build, or maybe even photos of, of what these back plates look like but a contactor, which is basically a big relay or a big on-off switch. So there's nothing coming out of the positive terminal until it gets a signal to turn on and allow signal out of there. So even if you were to, you know, jam something into these connectors here, there is no live current. You can also see down the bottom there a fuse. So 
each each of the positive the positive output is always fused on both packs. On one side, it's the negative that goes through the contactor, and on one side, it's the the other side. It's the positive that goes through the contactor. So basically, these side packs act as the most positive, most negative points in the whole pack. And in this case, the front pack that, that will be in the engine bay is the middle point of this whole circuit. Getting electricity to spin a motor might be pretty straightforward. Fitting everything into this into a, a car that wasn't designed for it is very challenging. But the other challenging thing is making sure that's safe and reliable for the life of the vehicle. And not just in everyday operation, but of course in those outlier situations where you've had an accident, the car's rolled over, you're running out of energy, the extreme temperatures, whatever that might be, making sure that we've got systems in place and have a system that fails safe when it does fail, if it fails, hopefully, but when it does fail eventually, that everything is safe and everything is, is built to handle those extreme situations. Every battery module that we put in every car has gone through a number of checks, so we're referencing when it arrived from our supplier, what its cell voltage was on every cell as it arrived, what its Tesla serial number is, what our serial number that we've placed on it is. So every battery pack also has assembly photos added to it. Here, oh, you can actually see the back plate. I don't need to find some old stuff. You can see the back plate assembly in one of those boxes we just saw with the with the fuse and the, and the uh, contactor up here and the control wiring coming through. Um, you can see the little nylon nuts I was talking about on every bolt head, so there's never any chance of those interfering. The complexity of the wiring is really down to the 12 volt system. So all these small wires, it's all our 12 volt wiring that does all the control and runs all the functions of the car. The hazardous voltage stuff here in the orange is actually quite the, the simple circuit. Um, it's just a battery connecting to a motor. So everything else is around the, the safety and the control of all that. Now, we're gonna go through in detail the 12 volt in another video, but I just wanted to talk about one of the other aspects of the battery safety system, which is the inertia switch. And this is something that is probably in your car right now, whether it's an EV or it's a petrol or a diesel car, any modern car will have one of these. And here's one in a Defender with the engine conveniently removed so you can see it. And this would have been connected to the electric fuel pump. So the, in, the, in the event of a crash, this would have triggered and cut power to that fuel pump, which would mean that it effectively shuts off the engine in the result of the crash. Just snooping around at other people's work after they've gone home. But, um, you know, we're not doing anything that other manufacturers aren't doing. You know, we've got a quality control checklist, right? But again, it's just part of the, the system of building, being able to build a repeated um, standardized vehicle, in this case the series Land Rovers, means we can put the effort into creating all this documentation so that every battery pack on every car has gone through a quality control checklist, both electrical, mechanical, it's been signed off, We've got, you know, the torque ratings of every um, of every bolt that goes into the car that someone's checked those and has been signed off again after completion. So all of these things just go into that level of, I guess, refinement and, and quality product, but also peace of mind once you own the car that all this documentation is accessible to you through our system. So an inertia switch is basically a relay, but one that's controlled by motion rather than an electrical current. So if I just shake this, you can hear it now, there's a little ball bouncing around and that is now open. I can press it and close it again. That level of force, which didn't look like much in my hand, but inside a vehicle, if a car was to experience that level of G-forces, that would be a major, major collision. So it's designed to only trigger in an extreme collision or in very, very rare cases, people doing crazy four-wheel drive stuff may trigger them. So it cuts off a fuel pump in a petrol or a diesel car but in an electric vehicle, it cuts off the batteries, which is the equivalent. So this is connected to another relay, which is connected to the control of our positive and negative contactor. And in the event of a collision, this will cut power to the junction box, to the motor, basically disable the whole uh, high voltage electrical circuit.